sip together, Gateway. Come on. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. It's good to be in your house. Sing. Praise and say, glorify your name. Let's do this together, church. Come on. This is the day you made. I rejoice and be glad with all that I am. This is the day you made. I rejoice and be glad in you. Yeah. 
As we start strong this year, Gateway, we sing to God and we lift Him praise. We say our yes. We run to the Father. And as, as we sing these songs, we prepare our hearts to be ministered. Amen. Come on, let's worship Him together, Gateway.
worship Him as one gateway. There's one thing that we are reminded of that when we pray, we use the power of declared words. Amen. And we sing those prayers, it amplifies. Let's prepare our heart gateway. So as we worship Him, let's just wait for the Holy Spirit.
come together and to just celebrate His goodness, to thank Him, to just bow down to His presence and just worship Him. Amen, Gateway. Hallelujah. Thank you for worshiping with us, Gateway. Before the announcements behind me, please have a moment to move around. Bless your neighbors. Greet them with your good Sunday morning greeting. Thank you, Gateway. Amen. Good morning, Gateway. Happy Sunday. Happy New Year. We hope your New Year is off to a great start. And we're so glad to see you in church the first week of the New Year. This is a great way to start your New Year. So welcome to church this morning. If you're a guest with us, we want to extend a very special Gateway welcome to you. Our prayer is that you feel so welcomed and encouraged in today's service. If you are that guest, we'd love if you do us a favor and fill out what we call a Connect card. You can find one of those cards under the seat in front of you or on the table at the back of the auditorium. Simply fill it out and drop it in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. Also, if you are that guest, we have a special Gateway gift bag just as a small way of saying thank you for joining us in today's service. At the end of the service, you'll find one of our friendly Gateway volunteers at the table at the southwest corner of the auditorium. Simply head there after the service and let them know that it's your first time at Gateway today. Also at that table, we have Bibles. So if you're here today and you don't have a Bible of your very own, we want to make sure you have one in your hands before you leave church. Just head to that table at the end of the service and let our Gateway volunteer know. If you haven't yet, why don't you give us a follow on social media? You can find us on Instagram at gateway.regina and on Facebook and YouTube at Gateway Church Regina. Make sure you're staying tuned to our online church calendar for everything that goes on here at the church throughout the week. You can find that calendar at gatewayonline.ca slash what's happening. Now here's a few special dates to keep in mind. Starting this Tuesday in two days, we are back with our Tuesday evening Bible study at seven o'clock right here at the church. This theme is going to be on discipleship and we will be going through the series called Getting a Grip on the Basics. This is a great Bible study that overviews the basics of Christianity. Whether you're a new believer or have been a believer for many years, this Bible study is for anyone. So come on out this Tuesday at seven o'clock. There is a sign up sheet at the info desk so you can sign up so we are aware of how many to plan for. And also the participant guides for getting a grip on the basics are $15. So you can come prepared to get your very own copy of the manual. This class is facilitated by Wally Adabogan. Also, starting on Wednesday, January 24th at 10 a.m., we will be offering a brand new book reading connect group. This time, we'll be reading the book, The Great Disappearance by Dr. David Jeremiah. As you may have guessed, this book talks about the rapture, so this is going to be an exciting and informative book. This class will be once again on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. starting on January 24th, and the book reading class will be facilitated by Adele Neal. There is a sign-up sheet at the info desk if you want to participate in this class, and books can be purchased through us for $25. For all of you parents of Gateway Junior Youth, which is ages 7 to 11, please be reminded that your next event is on the last Sunday of January, right here at the church, following the second service, starting at 1 p.m. and going until 3 p.m. As we step into the new year here at Gateway, we have new faces in the Gateway family, and we are so thankful for each and every one of you. Here are a few things to keep in mind as we come into this new year. In our 9.30 a.m. services on Sunday, we have Gateway Kids for ages toddler up to six. Now these classes start at the beginning of the service. So parents, when you arrive with your toddler to age six kids, you can head right on upstairs and leave them with our Gateway Kids leaders, and then you yourself can head into the service. At our 11.30 service, we have Gateway Kids for ages toddler all the way to 11. For those kids ages toddler to six, parents, as soon as you arrive, you can take those kids upstairs and leave them with our Gateway Kids leaders. Ages seven to 11, stay with us in the service for worship, and then as soon as worship is over, the seven to 11 kids can be dismissed to go upstairs and meet with their Gateway Kids leaders. Parents, thank you for keeping those ages and times of classes in mind. Also, the start of a new year is a great time to get connected with one of our volunteer teams. If you are here a part of the Gateway family and you have chosen to make Gateway your church home, we would love to put you on one of our volunteer teams. This is a great way for you to serve and get connected and meet other people. Also, as you know, it takes many hands to make church happen here at Gateway. So we would love to get you involved on a volunteer team. There are volunteer cards on the tables at the back of the auditorium, so you can fill one out and drop it in one of the giving boxes today. 
Thank you, Gateway, for giving into God's house. When you give into God's house, you are being obedient to God's word. And obedience brings blessing. So we believe that as you continue to give into God's house this year, that you and your family will be blessed. There are three ways you can give into God's house today. The first is by giving in person. You can drop your giving in one of the giving boxes. The second way to give is by giving online. You can head to gatewayonline.ca slash give and give by card or PayPal. And the third way to give is text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's on the screen right now and follow the prompts. That's all I got for you, Gateway. So have a great week. We look forward to seeing you right back here next Sunday. And hey, why not invite someone to join you for church next Sunday? Now, Pastor Brian, over to you for the first part in our new series, Be Prepared. All right, good afternoon, Gateway. Happy New Year, everybody. So good to have you here on this first Sunday of a brand new year. Hopefully your year is off to a good start. Just turn to your neighbor and say, so far, so good. <laughs> Amen. Some of you might be saying that by faith, but uh, even so, let it be a great year for Gateway Christian Fellowship. Can you say amen? amen. Well, I'm hoping that this Christmas season has been just a, a great opportunity for all of you to connect with family and friends. Got to tell you about one lady. She was relating to a friend of hers that during the Christmas season, she sent each one of her seven grandchildren a Christmas card. And she said, if I may say so myself, the checks that I uh, deposited in each one of those cards was, was a fairly generous check. And she said, you know what? All seven of my grandkids made a point of coming to visit me during the Christmas season to say thank you for the gift, Grandma. And her friend said, wow, seven out of seven. That is really good. And the grandma said, yeah, especially because the last couple of Christmases, most of those grandkids didn't bother to even say thank you. And her friend said, well, what do you think made the difference this year? And, and the grandma said, well, that's easy. This year when I sent them those cards, I didn't sign the checks. <laughs> Don't worry, grandma is not losing her memory. She is as sharp as ever. Come on, before we get into this session, would you stand to your feet and boldly repeat after me, I love God. Therefore, I love the word of God, the teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow his example. See, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Amen. Come on, somebody give some praise to the Lord. What a privilege to be here on this first Sunday of a brand new year. Let it be precedent setting. Amen. Let's pre set a precedent here today. You know, in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it says that, that Jesus got in that groove. It was the pattern of his life to be in the synagogue every Sabbath. That's a great pattern to establish, isn't it? Thank you for that overwhelming response. Come on, isn't that a great pattern to have operating in your life? Week after week, I am found in the house of the Lord every Sunday. That's a good thing. Just turn to your neighbor and say, get in the groove. Amen. You can be seated. And just a quick word to those who are joining us online. Really nice to have you with us for the ride today as well. And so good morning or good afternoon or good evening to you whenever it is that you are watching this on YouTube. But today we're starting a new year with a new teaching series. And we're calling this series, this is, this is about the calling of, of John the Baptist. And so the title for this series is Be Prepared. Everybody say, Be Prepared. Be prepared. Yeah, some of you would immediately recognize that's the motto of the Boy Scouts. But even more importantly, it was the motto of John the Baptist. That was his favorite sermon to preach. Be prepared. So you understand, the dawning of the New Testament era came with the arrival on the scene of Jesus of Nazareth, right? But there was a prophet of God that was called by the Lord to be the forerunner 
Yeah, the one who would go before Jesus to prepare the way and to make the announcement, the Lord is coming, people, so get your faith in gear. And of course, that forerunner was none other than John the Baptist. So for the next six weeks, we're going to be taking a look at six different episodes from the life and times of, of John the Baptist. We're going to read about the first one in just a moment here, but, but here's what I want you to be watching for. Just as John was commissioned to prepare the way of the Lord in his day, likewise, everybody say likewise. likewise. Yeah, likewise, in our generation, we are called, yep, you and I, we are called to prepare ourselves and to help prepare others for the coming of the Lord. That's a big deal. How many of you know that's a big deal? He's coming back. Just turn to your neighbor and say, it might be sooner than you think. He's coming. All right, so John the Baptist, his message was be prepared. And the message of the church, the church as a whole, and every one of us as an individual follower of Jesus, our message that we bear to our generation is be prepared. So how well do you know yourself? Come on, would you, would you say that you are a, a be well prepared kind of person or not so much? You know, there was one lady who was highly organized. She was a plan ahead, you know, get your ducks all in a row kind of person. But for her husband... He was more of a, you know, just take life as it comes kind of guy. And one day this wife, she was, she was planning well in advance. In fact, she was making funeral arrangements for the two of them. And, and at one point she turned and she said to her husband, she said, Honey, would you prefer burial by casket or cremation? He looked up from his newspaper. He said, Surprise me. <laughs> Personally, I prefer option C instead of, you know, by casket or cremation. I, I would rather go by rapture. What do you think? It's far more economical. It really is. Now, listen very carefully. What I want you to see over the next several weeks is that this man, John the Baptist, was a very unique individual. I mean, his method, his, his manner, his demeanor. He was a somewhat unusual guy. Now, I'm not asking you to become weird please don't but hear me there was a certain boldness everybody say boldness oh that's a godly quality there was a certain boldness about John he possessed this boldness or maybe we could say the the, the boldness possessed him but but it, it, it's a quality that every one of us do would do well to to be characterized by in the year 20. 24. Come on, this year is coming at us, and we, we cannot afford to just be going about business as usual. Nothing changes around here. No, we cannot do that. We, we got to get with the Lord's program. We got to move onward, upward. We got to be moved by the Holy Spirit. We got to experience this Holy Ghost boldness. Come on, just waiting for somebody to say amen. I say, Holy Spirit, show us that in the last days, the church needs to have a strong spirit, a strong voice, a strong influence, strong biblical convictions. We need to have that John the Baptist style boldness. How about a bold amen or two? Just throw them at me. You will not scare me away if you say hallelujah. The gospel of Matthew, let's read from chapter three, beginning in verse one. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So this John the Baptist, he was the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah's writings. Isaiah wrote this 700 years earlier. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. See, John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan River. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by John in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, that would be the religious leaders of the day, when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducee types coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes. Whew. 
He said, who invited you? (laughs) Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. Do not in your religious minded thinking that, that you don't need this preaching. Well, we have Abraham as our father. Don't say that to yourself. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. But I'm telling you right now, the ax is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. As you can see, John didn't beat around the bush. He didn't sugarcoat his preaching. He's a straight shooter, as we say. Bold as a lion. So who is this man, John the Baptist? If we backpedal to verse 1, it says he came preaching in the desert. That was familiar territory for John. He spent most of his life there. You know, if you were here last Sunday, you recall that we were in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, which is all about the birth of John the Baptist and his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And, and, and the final verse of that, of that chapter, it's verse 80. It says this, And the child grew... And became strong in spirit. And he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. Which he did at the age of 30. So obviously he didn't just wander off into the desert as a child, right? Certainly Elizabeth and Zechariah raised him and and taught him when he was a boy. but, but, But it's apparent that somewhere along the line, at some point the Holy Spirit led John into the wilderness. Sounds sounds like something a Boy Scout would do, right? A wilderness survival camp. But but John's out there roughing it. And all the while, he's he's being prepared by the Lord to, to come and bear this message. Prepare for the coming of the Messiah. So there he is out there in the wilderness. And now he appears on the scene. This, this verse tells us that he grew strong in spirit. The old King James Version says he became mighty in spirit. What does that mean? There are some verses, some phrases in Scripture. You've got to ponder over it. John became strong in spirit. I think it has something to do with strong nature, strong character. I think this is a a strong-willed individual. I think it's got something to do with Holy Ghost boldness. Remember Luke 1, 15 said that he was filled with the Holy Spirit right from birth. That's a unique individual. Folks, do you suppose that John the Baptist was one of these these people that was a strong-willed child who became a strong-willed adult? And I mean that in a good way. You got to wonder, what was it like for Zechariah and Elizabeth as senior citizens to be parenting a little junior John the Baptist? Because no doubt, even at a young age, he was probably a bundle of boldness. Okay, Johnny, you, you run along and play in the wilderness playground, and we'll see you when you're 30. <laughs> you know, there was a grandma and grandpa who were babysitting their grandson for about three weeks during summer vacation. And, and this guy, he was a handful, and that's putting it mildly. On day three of his visit to grandma and grandpa's place, Gra- grandpa took him down to the hardware store and bought him a bicycle. Later in the day, grandma got grandpa aside, and she said, Henry, do you honestly believe that buying a bicycle for Travis is going to solve his misbehavior? Grandpa said, no, but it's going to spread it out over a much broader territory. (laughs) Come on, what was it like for for Zachariah and Elizabeth to be parenting John the Baptist? He's probably a great kid. I mean, different, but really precious is my guess. You know, he's he's probably out there trying to baptize all of of his friends when they go swimming in the the lake, you know. But overall, I, I think he was a very godly child. But the quality that I I want you to notice, I want you to really pick up on this this quality that we clearly see in John the Baptist. He was bold. He was so bold. He fearlessly preached repentance. This is a guy who denounced sin. He was not a wimp. Some would describe him as eccentric. You know, that verse 4, it says his clothes were made of camel hair. He had a leather belt around his waist, it says. By the way, I have a leather belt around my waist right now. (laughs) 
he had a steady diet of grasshoppers and honey. So we can safely assume that he was not obese, right? He was a prophet of God, a little different than most of the other kids in his Sunday school class, right? But verse 7, it says, when the Pharisees and Sadducees came to see what was going on, he called them a brood of snakes. How's that for blunt? John the Baptist was John the bluntest. Matthew chapter 14, verse 4, he rebuked King Herod to his face. Why? Because Herod married his brother's wife, Herodias. Can you just hear John the Baptist getting right in the face of Herod and say, ah, that is not right, and Herod, you know it. Well, he got himself imprisoned for that. And if he called out Herod like that, I'm thinking, how many others was John so direct with to correct them? Oh, yeah, John was bold. He was bold, all right. Remember last week in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, the angel Gabriel, he's, he's talking to Zechariah, telling him, you and your wife are going to have a baby boy, and you're going to call him John. And listen, this kid, when he grows up, he's going to have the same kind of spirit, the same kind of power, the same brand of anointing that was seen in the prophet Elijah. Remember Elijah back in the Old Testament? Wow. As a powerful man of God in his, in his own right, Elijah, he was not a shy guy. Remember when he challenged the 450 prophets of Baal to a contest? You call on your God, and I'll call on my God, the God of Israel, and whoever's God answers by fire from heaven, let him be God. Woo, Elijah didn't back down from those prophets of Baal, not one inch. But he certainly turned around and prayed and, and said, Lord, you're going to have to back me up on this one. And the Lord did. Folks, I wouldn't want you to think of John the Baptist as some kind of a wild man. He wasn't. But he had a certain boldness. He had clearly a sense of, of calling, a sense of preparedness for the coming of the Lord. He, he had a boldness that, that, that should make us say, I want to be more like that. See, when we make that personal decision to become a follower of Jesus, isn't that just the, the best decision you ever made in your whole life? Man, when we clue in to, to the, the, the simple concept of the gospel, God sent his son to be a sacrificial lamb, to, to, to assume all of the blame, all of the shame, all of the guiltiness, all of the sins and, and corruption of the entire human race, it was all dumped on Jesus when he hung on that cross. He took the judgment of God against the sins of the world so that we wouldn't have to face God's judgment. How good is that good news? That's what the word gospel means. Good news. We can be off the hook. We can be spiritually reborn and get a fresh brand new start in life by simply putting our faith in the saviorship of Jesus. When we come to that lucid moment of realization, Jesus, I get it. I need a savior. And you're the only Savior there is. So what are we waiting for, Lord? Please come into my life and forgive my sin. I'm so ready to follow you. I will follow you all the way to heaven. This is the gospel. And man, when we cash in on that offer of salvation, that, that, that's just the wisest moment in our entire life. And, and, and so many things are, are just subject to change about how the way we, the, the way we do life now that we know Jesus. But, but listen, when you become that, that spiritually reborn child of God, it's not just that, well, now I have a brand new identity. I'm a Christian. Oh, it's so much more. It's not only that now I have a new set of doctrinal beliefs. Now I have a new lifestyle. Now I have a new moral code of conduct. Now I have a new set of friends. Now, now I have a new Sunday morning routine. Instead of going for brunch with the boys every Sunday morning, now, now I go for worship with the believers every Sunday morning. How good is that? Listen, it is all of the above, but it is also, listen, a new sense of calling. Everybody say sense of calling. Oh, don't you dare go through life without a sense of God-given calling. So vital to have a sense of calling. John the Baptist, he had a calling on his life, and so do you and I. 
Yeah, John knew who he was. He knew who his cousin was, Jesus. And John knew what his role was. Prepare the way for the Lord. He's coming. You see, as a follower of Jesus, You and I, we have a high and holy calling on our life. It is a mandate to help prepare for the Lord's return. Have you ever met somebody who spoke in these terms about themselves? Or or maybe they were speaking about somebody else. But but they talked about somebody whose whose work was, was not just a job. You know, another day, another dollar. But they spoke about somebody who gets up in the morning and they go to work. And, and it's not just a job. It's a calling. It's a ministry. It's a deep sense of satisfaction, a sense of fulfillment, a sense of calling. I have figured out what the Lord cut me out for, and I'm doing it. And it feels so awesome to be doing what I was created and recreated to do and to be. Ever talk with somebody that that talks about their job as if it's not just a job? But it's a calling, man. It's a strong sense of of purpose that they derive from, from what it is that they do every day. They are invested in their work. You see, a sense of calling will produce in us a passion. Not passive. How many people know what it is to go to work and they're very passive, you know, very, you know, well, it's a job, you know, it's a paycheck. Even in the body of Christ. Man, this is not the time for believers to be passive. It's the time for us to be passionate about what what the Lord has for us and what he has called us to do and to be. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. Folks, as we press ahead into the year 2024, we've never been there before. This is new territory for us, but oh, lead on, Lord, as as we get into this new year. I'm not asking you to grow long hair and go downtown and wear an A board that says, repent, Jesus is coming. Please don't do that. I'm not asking you to become abrasive or abusive. No, boldness does not mean bossy or brash. But but would you allow the Lord to produce in you this year a greater degree of John the Baptist-like boldness, a little bit more grit and, and growl in the way you do your Christianity? Has anybody noticed? The world has gone mad. I tell you, the signs of the times are ripe for rapture. Do you see it? Man, the the Antichrist spirit, it's all over the place. This one world system is all around us. It is not just on the drawing board. It's already in motion. Not not only that, but but the the anti-Semitism is at an all-time high. Have Have you noticed this? Clearly. A sign of the time prior to the return of the Lord. I'm telling you, our generation is a degeneration desperately in need of regeneration, which is spiritual rebirth. Again, somebody say amen. It's not time for status quo in the church. It's time for us to be on high alert. You know that in 2 Timothy 3, 1, it says, in the last days, perilous times will come. Well, I got news for you. Perilous times are not coming. They're here. Oh, honey, they're here. These are perilous times that we are living in. Would anybody care to agree with me that 2024 is good timing for the body of Christ to develop a strong backbone? Everybody say backbone. We're not talking about wishbone. Yeah, I wish somebody would do something about the world's problems. No, we're talking about backbone. The stiffening of the spine of the body of Christ. It means that we exercise courage of conviction. It means we take a stand for what we believe. It means that like John the Baptist, we speak up for what is right. Most of you just missed a great chance to say amen right there. Listen carefully to this statement. The urgency of our Christian faith is directly proportional to the proximity of the Lord's return. In other words, the closer we get to the rapture, the more radically outspoken we should be in preparing people for His coming. Say amen if you dare. Listen, as New Testament Christians, 
We are called by God to help as many people as possible to become rapture ready. The question is, will we be bold about this assignment or kind of timid? Like, where do you see yourself in this? Would you, would you admit that you need to become a little bit more like John the Baptist? A little more boldness would, would do us good. You know, there was one pastor who was, who was preaching about John one Sunday, and he was really getting into his message, and he said, John said this, and John the Baptist did that, and then he really got amped up, and at one point he said, what this church needs is more Johns. And then he realized that came out sounding a little different than what he meant. <laughs> for those who are not aware, that term John, that's a slang term for washroom. <laughs> Here at Gateway, we have plenty of washroom facilities, but we could use some more Johns. What's that going to look like? What does that mean? That, that, that John the Baptist type boldness. How, how, how would that work in practical terms in your life? And mine? It might mean that you need to come right out and tell someone that they need the Lord. Like no beating around the bush anymore. Yeah, but Pastor, I don't, I don't think I can actually talk to that person about their need of the Lord. It's obvious that they need the Lord, but Pastor, I've been praying for them that they would come to the Lord. Not good enough. It's good. Keep praying. Don't stop praying. Oh, definitely intercede on behalf of people that need the Lord. But there comes a point where we need to open up and, and, and express in, 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 in loving boldness. We need to tell them about the Lord. It might mean that you need to confront someone regarding a glaring sin in their life. Do you really care about that individual? Do you love them enough to, to not just turn a blind eye and not say anything? It might mean that in your workplace chatter, when, when some biblical value is under attack, it means that you need to show your true colors and speak up and be a defender of the word of God. Please. Please defend the truth of the word. Now, please note all this talk about repenting of, of sin. I am not. I repeat, I am not asking you to live with sin consciousness. Goodness, no. We get it that in Christ, we are righteous, fully righteous. We do not live under some cloud of condemnation. There's no guilt complex sinner mentality. No, by grace, by grace. Everybody say by grace. Yeah, it's by the grace of God that we are righteous in Christ. More about that next week. But listen, good old-fashioned repenting of sin is still a very valid New Testament truth. For Pete's sake, on the day of Pentecost, the New Testament church was born when Peter got up and preached repentance. Oh, there's a place for rep repentance. No kidding around. Somebody said, well, Pastor Brian, I, I'm not really the bold type. That's not really me. I'm more of a, a quiet-natured individual. I'm not really bold, Pastor. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. You know, if we, if we looked at a scale from 1 to 10, 1 being real shy and 10 being real bold, all my life, all my life, I've been the type of person that leans, strongly leans toward the shy end of the scale. Now, baptism of the Holy Spirit made a massive difference in my life, but still, for many, many years, I have struggled, struggled with this issue of, you know, trying to be Mr. Nice Guy, you know, what the Bible calls a man pleaser. Now, that may sound like a good thing, but it's not. It's a bad thing. I've battled against that. Like, how would you feel about your pastor shifting in 2024 and moving even more toward the, the bold end of the spectrum? Yeah, so, so somebody might, might be saying, oh, actually, he's already a little bit too radical for my liking. <laughs> Folks, we can do this. Come on. 
As a church body, as individuals, as family units, we can be about our Father's business. And it calls for some boldness. It calls for some help from the Lord. And help is available. Come on. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 is still in the book. That's the one that says, faithful is he that calls you who also will do it. Faithful is he who calls you. We have the call of God upon our lives to rise up and be bold and speak to our generation. Faithful is the one who calls you who also will do it. He will not call you to do something and then just hang you out to dry. You're on your own, kid. No, he will help us to do whatever he asks us to do. Somebody say amen. Amen. Let me bring it down to this. The key to be prepared in the last days is the same as it is in the days of John the Baptist. Here it is. It's the Holy Spirit factor and the word of mouth factor. Again, the Holy Spirit factor. Oh, that's, that's vital. That's, that's crucial. There's got to be the Holy Spirit that comes into play. And then there's the word of mouth factor. Both are so necessary. Earlier we read from Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2. Let me run it by you again. Here's what it says. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, repent, people, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You got to get right with God. Wow, John came preaching repentance. Repent of your sins. Isn't that just one of your favorite words, sin? Time to call sin, sin, and preach against it. Not make excuses for it. Repent repent of your sins. That was John's message. That's not generally a sermon topic that draws a crowd. You know, like, well, what, what would it be if we, if we advertised our next teaching series? We're going we're gonna to call this series Hellfire and Brimstone. I mean, who's going to come? Well, in the case of John the Baptist... Lots of people came. Look at verse 5 and 6. It says, People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan. They came in droves. They're coming from every direction, from all over the map. This is full on revival. People were repenting and confessing their sins and being baptized. John is preaching, baptizing, preaching, baptizing. Wow. John the Baptist gained a huge following. He had disciples, the Bible says. And then later on, John's disciples defected and they became followers and disciples of Jesus. And John, John was good with that. He said, that's fine. He said, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. Go ahead and and follow him. But what's going on here? John is preaching. He's he's taken a, a hard stance against sin. And yet people are signing up and they're lining up for the baptism of repentance. What else could it be that's happening here but the Holy Spirit factor? People are coming under conviction. They were drawn by the Holy Spirit. Here's what you need to know. Here's the the backdrop behind the story of John the Baptist. Prior to John coming on the scene, there hadn't been a prophetic voice in Israel for over, get this, 400 years. That's a long time. You see, see, 400 years. We call it in, in theology, we call that the 400 intertestamental silent years. In other words, between the end of the Old Testament, the conclusion of the writings of the prophet Malachi, from the end of the Old Testament until the beginning of the New Testament when John and Jesus showed up on the scene, that's 400 years of silence. Nothing, not a single word from God. See, back in the Old Testament history of Israel, there was was prophets of God and and the writings of the prophets. So the prophets were were preaching. The prophets were speaking on behalf of God and addressing the people. And they were putting the, the word of the Lord down in print. And that's why a big chunk of your Old Testament is the writings of the major and minor prophets. And prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. Believe me, Israel was hearing from the Lord. But then, boom, 400 years, not a word. Silence. 
until this prophet called John the Baptist broke the silence and he came on the scene and he set up shop down there in the desert by, by the Jordan River and he's preaching and he's baptizing. Listen, how long do you think it took for word to get spread around the neighborhood? There's a prophet that has come preaching in the desert and he's preaching about the coming of the Messiah. Come on. Let's go hear what this prophet has to say. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can be sure. Word got around. John's out in the desert, and he's preaching, coming soon to a synagogue near you, the Messiah. John was under the influence of the Holy Spirit, for sure. And the crowds were under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Listen, in John's day, it was the Holy Spirit factor and the word of mouth factor. And in our day, as we anticipate, based on the clear signs of the time, surely Jesus is coming pretty soon. And the same thing that was true in John's day is true in our day. It's the Holy Spirit factor and it's the word of mouth factor. Folks, I'm believing. Please believe with me. Get your faith in agreement with me that we, we will come out the other end of not only these five or six weeks as we launch a brand new year, but as we get deeper and deeper into the year 2024, it's not going to be just same old, same old, but there's going to be the Holy Spirit stirring up in us a new spirit of boldness. Come on, somebody say amen. I'm believing that we're coming out the other end of this, uh, this initial six-week period with a little bit more out spokenness, a little bit more fearlessness, a little bit more of, of what it is to be, to be full of Holy Ghost, John the Baptist, boldness. That's what I'm believing. Anybody want to believe that with me? I'll tell you, the age we're living in, it calls for an outspoken church, outspoken men and women of God, every one of us having the call of God upon our lives to help prepare the way for the Lord, to get the word out there and say, Jesus is coming back. My goodness, you need to, to get right on that, my friend. You need to come to the Lord while the getting is good. That's our job. That's our job. That's a job to be passionate about. That's, that's not, not just another day, another dollar, especially since you're a volunteer in this outfit. Right? Let's take up the call. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to, to stir boldness in us. Let's be open. Let's be willing. Let's, let's, let's get before the Lord in prayer. Come on, let's, let's be chatting with one another. Let's, uh, let's allow this Holy Spirit boldness to take root and have some phenomenal effect in us and among us and, and through us. There's no telling how many people will be positively impacted this year because of Holy Spirit boldness that is stirring in the church. Come on, would you stand to your feet? Do you know what? There are some people that do not have enough personal boldness to even be able to tell their best friend, uh, it's got a little bit of ketchup on your chin there. You should wipe that off. Some people don't even have the forthrightness to be able to tell them. I'm not telling them. You tell them. Listen, if they send out a family photo Christmas card, and in that photo, he's got that ketchup on his chin, you bear partial responsibility in that. Listen, telling them about the ketchup on his chin. That's a very, very low level of boldness required. Come on. But there are higher levels of boldness that the Lord is inviting us to experience. I love the story, true story, about a city transit bus driver in Chicago years ago. It's a busy time of day. The seats on the bus are occupied. There's people standing in the aisle of the bus. And, and, and he pulls over to the curb. And here's this guy, this, this shady-looking character that gets on, on the bus. And the bus driver recognizes him. 
And as this man begins to work his way from the front of the bus toward the back of the bus, the bus driver calls out, Watch your valuables, folks. Pickpocket on board. I like that bus driver. That bus driver's got some righteous boldness circulating in his system. See, that? that's a higher level of boldness required than, hey, hey you got some ketchup on your chin. And there, there are higher levels yet. When there's somebody in your life and you care about that individual and they don't know the Lord and it's obvious that they need the Lord and you've got to have the the forwardness to be able to reach out and and talk to them and lovingly address them about their spiritual need. The time time is now. No kidding around. Holy Spirit, I pray. I pray that you would stir up in every one of us in this place a new sense of of boldness, a new sense of urgency, a new sense of of just the, the importance of the hour. Lord, we feel incredibly privileged that you have called us to be a part of your program in this in this late age of the church. Dear God, we're excited to see you working in unprecedented supernatural ways that there would be many, many people coming in to the family of God in these late hours of church history. Lord, help us. We're not just going to go about the business of our comfortable Christianity. No, in Jesus' name, we stand before you today and we're about to celebrate communion. Lord, we are so ready to rededicate ourselves, to live up to the call that you have placed upon our lives. So help us, Lord. Holy Spirit, infuse in your church a new sense of calling, a new sense of of boldness that we would rise above the fear and do what you have called us to do and be what you have called us to be. All of this in the beautiful name of our Savior Jesus. It's all for your sake, Lord. It's all for your glory, Lord. It's all for your divine purpose of bringing as many people home to heaven as you possibly can but you need our help and we recognize that. We're so willing, Lord. We declare that 2024 is an amazing year of Holy Ghost boldness and people giving their lives to you left, right, and center in Jesus' name. It's communion time. Communion is for believers. If you know Jesus as your Savior, so welcome to join us in this celebration. So before we receive the emblems, we're going to pray the prayer of salvation. My friends, it may be that there's individuals here today and you've never made that personal decision that I was alluding to earlier, the decision to just turn our lives over to the Lord and say, Jesus, I'm so ready to be born again and to follow you from here on out. So listen, in this personal moment of commitment with every head bowed and every eye closed, as we just stand before the Lord for a moment here, if you know that you need to commit to Jesus, that you need to be spiritually reborn, or maybe you know that you need to rededicate yourself to Christ, just raise your hand wherever you are across the room, and then in a moment we're all going to pray the prayer together. Who's here today and you just know, I need to do this. Yes, I see your hand up front. Good for you. See your hand as well. You never regret the decision. Yes, I see your hand. Are there others? Just just wave at me wherever you are if you just know. I need to do this. I need to do this. Yes, I see your hand at the back. Thank you. Good for you. Anybody else before we pray? Communion awaits us. But if you just know the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart and you just know, Pastor, I need to do this. I need to put my hand up. I need to to, to, to lift my life up and say, Jesus, I'm all yours. Yeah, good for you. I see your hand at the back. Thank you. Yeah. All right, come on, church. As we move into our celebration of communion, let's pray this prayer together. Would you join me? Let's all pray this. Heavenly Father, Of course, I give my life to you. Jesus, you gave your life for me. I believe you died on that cross to deal with my sin issues. I believe you rose from the dead to give me a brand new start. 
Forgive me, Lord. I repent of all my sin. Cleanse me with your precious blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Stir me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live out the Christian life with boldness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, somebody give the Lord a hand. All right, I get it. Yeah, you got your little communion kits already. (laughs) All right, time to celebrate. Just let there be a deep sense of gratitude, a deep sense of joy that rises up on the inside of you when you think about what Jesus has done for you and all that he has, has promised to do for you in the days ahead. Wow. I really mean it when I say celebrate communion, this little wafer symbolically representing for us the body of Jesus that was nailed to the cross. And then, of course, the grape juice symbolically representing the blood of the lamb that was poured out for our eternal redemption. This is so good. It doesn't get any better than knowing our place in the family of God. Can we celebrate communion this morning on this basis? The Lord has placed a calling on our lives. As you've heard me say many times before, communion is really a renewing of our covenant with God. Well, I tell you today, it is also a renewing of our awareness of the call that he has placed upon us. Oh yeah, we've been called by God. So with that in mind, let's receive the wafer in good faith. Thank you, Jesus, for all you have done for us. Amen. Do you sense it? Do you feel it? Do you know it? You've been called by God to serve Him in your generation. This is good. The Lord is with us. The Lord will help us. The Holy Spirit will empower us. If there's anything scary about reaching out and being that that bold spokesperson for the Lord, I tell you the Holy Spirit will help us to overcome that fear and get the job done. Amen. Called by God to be fearless in 2024. Let's receive the cup. Mm. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Wow, that's so good. So good. Man, what a privilege. What a responsibility. But what a privilege to be a part of this family of God. Folks, thank you so much for being here for our worship experience this afternoon. Listen, we're going to dismiss in just a moment with a word of blessing, but when the service is over, I want you to know this altar is open, and if you would like to receive some personal individual prayer, just make your way up to the altar, and one of our prayer partners will be only too happy to pray with you for sure. Also, I want to mention if you, if you have never taken a basic discipleship course in Christianity, or if you're new to the Lord, get out in that lobby and put your name on that list. Sign up. Sign up for Tuesday night. That discipleship course is real good, real good for you. So, uh, yeah, sign up for sure. And now, may the blessing of the Lord be upon every household represented here today as you go on your way from church. Go in the boldness of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, Gateway. Thanks again for being here today. Thank you for joining our online service today. We pray that you were so encouraged by the worship and the message. And hey, if you've been blessed by the worship and the messages here at Gateway, we'd love if you partner with us. You can head to gatewayonline.ca slash give to do so. And if you're in the Regina area, we would love to have you join us in person for one of our services very soon. There's a chair here waiting for you. But if you're not able to make it in person in Regina, we'll see you right back here next Sunday for another Church Online.